Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first in a new series of Home Choir's Deep Dives. Uh, and of course, we're not starting the broadcast for a few minutes yet. This is just my time to pop up and say hello to everyone who's here at the start of the live stream. So if you're watching later on, feel free to jump forward in the broadcast. I'll make sure it's time stamped so you can get straight to the start of the lecture. And today, well, we're talking about Johann Pachelbel but we're not going to talk about his canon in D. We're going to talk about him, his life, his influence on so many composers, in particular the Bach family, and we're going to look at his choral music. And I know some of you are missing the singing on a Wednesday afternoon. I just felt it was time for us to uh, bring the deep dives back for a little bit. And those of you who are missing the singing, well, it will be back later on in the summer. So those of you who are here live, just bear with me a moment whilst I do the all-important sound checks. Uh, no keyboard today, no warming up, but I do have some buttons to press. So let me check. We should have some lovely organ music here. <laughs> A little bit of uh, Pop Goes the Weasel slightly. Here's a bit of Magnificat. Lovely. Here's a beautiful cantata. And another Magnificat. Splendid. So I do have to say to you that I, the pieces that I will be playing extracts from today are absolutely glorious. And I'm going to recommend that you uh, check out, if you haven't already found them, the links which I've put in the description for today's video, which will take you to full versions of all of the performances you're going to hear. Uh, and I can thoroughly recommend, in particular, the Magnificat in D, which those of you in Choir of the Earth will already know, the Magnificat in C, more on that in a minute, and the beautiful Cantata, which I've linked to, I guess I say, in the description. All of them are sublime pieces. And if you have ever heard and thought, even for a moment, if you've thought that canon in D is lovely, because it is, there's a reason it's one of the most popular, if not the most popular piece of Baroque music ever, um, well, then you will love the music I'm going to share with you today. But there's lots more, as I say. This is the thing about the deep dives. We have so much to talk about with this wonderful composer. And I'll also be telling about what we're doing next week. Now then, let me welcome everyone who is here today, uh, and we've got lots of lovely folks waiting for a really good chat. And uh, thank you very much. I always try and make a special effort for a deep dive. <laughs> so it's splendid to see you all. We've got some birthdays to celebrate very shortly. Uh, Emma says, elbow patches. No, I, I'm afraid the, uh, the, the teacher's jacket, I, I took it out of the, uh, out of the wardrobe. Definitely needs to go to the dry cleaners. So no, no, not the elbow patches. But I thought, let's, let's dress smartly. It's packable, after all. Um, so those of you watching later on, hope you enjoyed the broadcast. As I say, you can skip through all of the natter and the happy birthdays and get straight to the lecture. But those of you who are here live, thank you for joining me. In particular, thank you to everyone who's watching live and, uh, and has already clicked the like button. If you haven't done so, please consider doing so. Likewise, do consider subscribing as well. Hello to everyone who's watching live, but not necessarily in the live chat. Very good morning to Helene and Bill and Val in California. Hello, Sue and Tony. Hello, Sally and Annie and Maureen. Hello, Anne and Linda, hello Charlotte and Nikki, hello to Huyen, hello to Val, hello to Katie in Thornbury. And then hello everyone over here. I hope you've all got your pencils ready. We're going to take some notes. There will be a test at the end. There won't be a test at the end. Good morning to everyone and good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is. Hello Angela, hello Breda, hello Carol, hello Carolyn, hello Kathy, hello Chris, hello Christine, hello Christine, hello Christine. Love to have all three of you with us. Hopefully Christine will be along in a minute. Hello Colette, hello Eileen, hello Emma, hello Fiona, hello Glennis, hello Hilary, hello Jackie, hello Jean, hello Jill, hello Kathy, hello Kim, hello Kit Kat, hello Linda, hello Mags, hello Michael, hello Mike, hello Nicola, hello Nikki, hello Patricia, hello Sheila, hello Susanna, hello Suzanne, hello Violet, hello Wendy, hello all of you. I do hope you're having a good day. Now, did I see it is Christine's birthday today? Wonderful. Well, we shall sing for you in a moment. We have a number of choristers to sing for. Let me make sure my birthday list is here. And we'll actually sing happy birthday in a minute before the lecture starts. So let me see. It is, according to my records here, uh, it is Sue's birthday. It is Andrew's birthday today and Christine as well. And it is Judith and Margaret's birthday tomorrow. 
So I think we should sing happy birthday to them. So if you would help me out, ladies and gentlemen, mm. say that again. That is Sue, Andrew, Christine, Judith and Margaret. Sue, Andrew, Christine, Judith and Margaret. Let's turn that piano up and have a really good sing to start off. Here we go. After two. A one, two. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sue, Andrew, Christine, Judith and Margaret. Happy birthday. Those of you missing a good sing on a Wednesday, well, that's all we've got in terms of singing today. But we do have some stunning music to share and some, I think, fascinating facts about a composer whose works we have all heard, but maybe we don't know anything more about him than just that canon in D. So do sit back and enjoy, and you'll uh, no need to uh, to do anything other than just let the facts uh, uh, come at you and take them as you will. We've got some lovely examples to share. As I was just saying, in the description for today's video, you'll find all the links. But I think we should get started. So here we go, everyone. A -doo -doo. Good afternoon and welcome to Home Choir's Deep Dive. This is the first in a new series of our very popular programme here on the channel. And we are looking at some of the great works and in particular, this week, we are looking at Johann Packelbell. Now, as I was just saying, you will know the name Packelbell, particularly if you've ever been to a wedding where they had a string quartet, because the canon in D is one of the best loved and most played pieces from the Baroque era. And But as I've been saying, as I'm sure you appreciate, Packelbell is uh, well known amongst those who know, uh, that is to say, organists and lovers of Baroque music, will know that he is far more than just this one piece. And today we hope to bring you all of that information and more and hopefully send you off on your way with an appreciation for a great composer and an all-round uh, very nice guy and also with a curiosity to go and seek out more of his music because he wrote over 500 works. So it's far more than the canon in D. Now, before we get started, my name is Ben. This is Home Choir. If you're new to the channel, do consider, please, hitting the like button and subscribing. If you'd like to support the channel, you can donate to us. And as we are 100% supported by donations from our community, uh, we, we can't do this without your support. So thank you very much indeed to everyone who donates, whether it is a one-off or whether you give us every month. So let's get on and let's talk about this chap here. This is what Packlebell looked like, or at least this is what we think he looked like. As always, all of these representations of the composers are based far more in a stylized, ideal view of what people looked like in those days. And if you look him up, if you try and find out what he looked like, well, you can't find one picture that looks like the other. But this apparently is what Packlebell looked like. And far more, as I say, than the canon in D. But let's talk, before we uh, dive into Packlebell's life, let's talk a little bit more about the Baroque period. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the deep dives, those of you that have come along perhaps to some of my other lectures with the Around Sound channel and so on, will already know that the Baroque era is a very, very wide range of music. We say that it started around about 1600. Of course, it wasn't on the 1st of January, but that is around the time that music took a big leap forward, mainly with the music of Claudio Monteverdi, whose music we will look at later on this season. It then progressed through to around about 1750 when the classical era really got underway. So it's about 150 years worth of music. That's a lot of music. That's a long time. And in that era, uh, throughout that 150 years, so many people were born, lived, died, produced music, uh, and these styles evolved um, that actually you, you can say that there's such a thing as early Baroque, mid Baroque, late Baroque. And most of the Baroque composers that we know and love, such as these fine gentlemen over here, that's uh, Johann Sebastian Bach on the left, obviously Handel and Vivaldi, most of them are either mid or late Baroque. Um, but Packelbell is right in the middle. He is there in that 50-year uh, that period, right in the centre of the Baroque era. And the music of the Baroque era was characterised by uh, a, a more polyphonic approach. That is to say, interweaving lines, a sense of drama, a sense of everything being very ornamented and very decorated. And this is all reflected also in the architecture and in the writing and the art of the time. And choral music during this period often fe featured really beautiful, rich harmonies, uh, lush, intricate uh, polyphony, and the use of instruments to accompany rather than just double the voices. 
And the Baroque era also saw the development of many key uh, choral uh, genres, which we know today, including the oratorio, the mass, the cantata and the motet. And Pachelbel's music can be seen, everyone, as a bridge between the earlier Baroque styles of composers, such as Schutz, and the later, such as J.S. Bach, for reasons that I will explain very shortly. Now, let me quickly show you a timeline here. And if you're watching on a small screen, you won't be able to necessarily make this all out. But if you go over to Wikipedia and you put in Baroque composer timeline, you'll be able to see that if we started around 1600, the names are, uh, well, uh, as, what, as you would associate with late Renaissance, you've got composers such as Svelink, uh, Monteverdi, Frescobaldi, Schutz, and so on. And as it progresses uh, into the 1650s, you have composers like Lully and Buxtehude and uh, Charpentier. And there you see Johann Pachelbel born in the 1650s, and he was active then into the early 1700s. And it's not until the late 1600s we see composers like Telemann, Vivaldi, Bach, Handel being born, and they then took the style on into the 1700s. So let's talk about Pachelbel and his early life, everyone. So he was a German composer and organist. He was born in Nuremberg. Here is a representation of Nuremberg from around the time that Pachelbel was active. He died in Nuremberg uh, 52 years later. And uh, although it sounds like he never left, he did actually travel widely and actually um, set, set many of the, uh, uh, took many of the same steps as Haydn, ended up in many of the same places like uh, Eisenach and also Vienna. Uh, Pachelbel was a very important composer of this mid-Baroque era. He was prolific. Uh, he wrote more than 500 works, although many of them are either lost to time or have not yet been published. So currently languishing in all sorts of archives all around the world uh, are unpublished works by Pachelbel. I think we need to start a campaign to bring them to the public ear. Uh, he wrote for all sorts of ensembles. He wrote for organ. He wrote for chamber ensembles. And he wrote lots of choral music, as we will discover. His music was highly regarded in his time. He was a very well-known and much appreciated composer, but also a teacher and mentor to many respected composers, including Johann Sebastian Bach's older brother, Johann Christoph. Uh, we'll talk about his relationship with the Bachs shortly, but let's go right back to the start. Pachelbel was actually born into a middle-class family and showed early promise as a musician. How often do we hear that with these great composers? Born into a fairly well-to-do family, showed flair as a youngster and was given the opportunity uh, to then pursue it. Uh, not all great composers had such luck. Poor old Handel, of course, as we know, wanted to be a musician, but his father wanted him to be a lawyer. It was only on his father's death that he was allowed to then go off and become the great composer that he became. But Pachelbel, he had the support of his parents and uh, he was enrolled in uh, various high-profile music academies. In particular, he worked at the, was sent to the University of Altdorf and then went on to study at the Gymnasium Poeticum in Regensburg, which is represented here. Uh, the building still exists, and you can go and visit it today, and there are various uh, plaques and various displays up about Pachelbel and the fact that he had studied there. And when he was at the Gymnasium, he studied the works of leading contemporary composers such as Holberger and Frescobaldi. So there already he is getting the influence of the German uh, Lutheran school, but also the more flamboyant and operatic-led Italian style. Now, Pachelbel then later on went on to hold important posts as an organist in various cities, including Vienna, Eisenacht, Erfurt and Stuttgart, before ultimately returning to Nuremberg, where he died at the age of 52. Now, Pachelbel married twice. Very sadly, his first wife, although he married her in 1681, she and their son died in 1683. So this would have been uh, a real blow to Pachelbel. They died during an outbreak of plague. And Pachelbel's first published work, a page of which we can see here, was called Musikalische Sterbens Gedanken, that is to say, Musical Thoughts on Death. And it was written as a response to this tragedy. And interestingly, the style of this music is dark, as you'd imagine, but also very chromatic and shows a, uh, a, a break from the I suppose, more pedestrian music of the time. This was Pachelbel using music to convey his deep emotion uh, about this terrible, terrible tragedy. Now, ten months later, Pachelbel remarried. He married a lady called Judith Drommer, who was the daughter of a coppersmith, and they went on to have five sons and two daughters. 
Now, two of their sons, Wilhelm Hieronymus Pachelbel and Charles Theodore Pachelbel, went on to become composers themselves. And you can look up their works. There are several recordings of them right here on YouTube. Uh, and uh, one of them also, that's would say uh, Charles Theodore, became, uh, uh, sorry, yes, Charles Theodore moved to the American colonies in 1734, where he was rather successful. Another son, Johann Michael, became an instrument maker in Nuremberg and travelled as far as London and Jamaica. And interestingly, one of their daughters, Amalia Pachelbel, achieved great recognition as a painter and an engraver. So there we are. Now, let's talk about Pachelbel's relationship with the Bachs. And here we can see a very famous image. This is Bach's family tree, and you can look this up. It's a fantastic image. I think the original is kept in the Bach Museum in Germany, but uh, you can see the Bachs were uh, a highly active family, and they produced a great number of musicians, particularly organists. Uh, the Bach family was very well known in Erfurt, where, of course, uh, Pachelbel lived for a time. And virtually all organists in the city were Bachs for a while. And so Pachelbel was in inextricably linked to the Bach family. He became goddaughter to Johann Ambrosius' daughter, Johanna. He taught Johann Christoph, who was uh, Johann Sebastian's eldest brother, and he lived in Johann Christian Bach's house. So Johann Christian Bach was Johann Sebastian Bach's uncle. So Pachelbel basically had Bach's uncle as his landlord. Now, when Johann Christian Bach died, Pachelbel bought the house from his widow. And when his former pupil, Johann Christoph, that is to say Bach's eldest brother, got married in 1694, the Bach family had a huge celebration and uh, invited Pachelbel and other composers to perform and to provide the music. And so we know he did attend, and so he would have met Johann Sebastian Bach, but of course, Johann Sebastian at the time was only nine years old. So there we are. And uh, as we go through, you'll hear just how Pachelbel's music influenced Johann Sebastian Bach, and how could it not, given, given that he was around when he was, uh, was a child and his music was all around him as well. So let's talk about Pachelbel's outputs. As I said, he composed over 500 works, but over 100 sacred vocal works, including motets, cantatas, settings of the Magnificat. He also used choral music to influence his organ works. He very famously wrote a, a load of what were called the Magnificat Fugues, taking little snippets, little bits of the original plain chant tune and meditating on them, writing variations, writing, uh, writing pieces based on this original tune. And if you've sung the Magnificat in D, you know he does exactly this, as uses a technique called Cantus Firmus, where he takes a little section of the tune, stretches it out and composes underneath. So he, he basically set the entire Magnificat and each section, each work, displays the emotional content of the, uh, of the phrase or the section that he chose. Now, his motets often feature intricate counterpoint and are characterised by expressive text setting. And this is a feature of Pachelbel's music. Although he is working within a Lutheran tradition, he was also exposed to Catholic music, that is to say more Italian music, which is generally speaking uh, more, more emotional, more flamboyant and the, this um, amazing marriage of the Lutheran style with the Catholic influence brought together these two. Uh, you have the purity of the Lutheran style, but you have the beauty and you have the emotional depth of the Catholic style. And Pachelbel kind of married them and stitched them together. Um, his cantatas are stunning. We'll listen to one very shortly, typically uh, consisting of several movements, including choruses, arias and recitatives. Fans of Bach, does that sound familiar? Because it should. There's a huge influence on Bach's music. And uh, Bach, uh, Pachelbel's Magnificat Fugues are some of his most beautiful and innovative compositions. So I think what we should do is to listen to a little bit of one of these Magnificat Fugues. And uh, you'll see, as I press the button, you'll see the channel that I got this from, and huge thanks to them. Here's a little bit of Pachelbel. It's rather jaunty. Here we go. <laughs>
Absolutely lovely music, and I would urge you to go and listen to more of those wonderful Magnificat fugues. And as someone has pointed out here in the live chat, quite often they don't have a pedal line, make, making them much easier for organists to play and a great warm-up when you're getting ready to play something really big. Now, uh, Paco Bell's Cantatas. Now, so these, of course, are works to be performed as part of a service, as I already said, would usually have solo, would usually have restative and choruses. They're characterized by their varied structures and their rich harmonic language. So that is to say, uh, Paco Bell was pushing the boundaries of what he could achieve with the harmonic restrictions of the Lutheran church at the time, bringing in that Italian influence and quite often elaborating on the hymn text. And if you consider that Bach wrote, of course, all those amazing cantatas some decades later, it's very clear that Packelbell's cantatas were hugely influential on Bach. And what you'll hear in a moment when we listen to a little bit of one of his cantata settings is the amount of expressive text setting using techniques such as word painting, which is where the music will reflect what the words are saying. For example, in the Magnificat, you might sing disperse it as in scattered and the, the music might be broken up and might be disjointed. Uh, if the text is triumphant, the music will be triumphant. If the text is mournful, the music is mournful. And so he uses, uh, as I say, word painting and mel melodic contour, that is to say the shape of the tune, to highlight the meaning and the emotion of the text. And whilst many of his cantatas were composed for specific religious occasions and services, others were intended for just general use in church services. So let's have a little listen to a section of one of his cantatas. This is absolutely sublime and uh, do enjoy. Here we go. <laughs> Just two shakes. Let's try that one. Absolutely beautiful music, and that, as you can probably tell, is part of a larger work. Please do go and have a listen to the whole thing, which is linked in the description. And I just find it fascinating to hear the interplay between solo and choir, which, of course, was so influential on the 17th, well, the late 17th and early 18th century composers who were working around the same time. Again, those beautiful, rich harmonies, but all always with a sense of purity of line, which comes back to the Lutheran tradition. If you consider that these choral melodies are a key element in the Lutheran church music, it is a simple homophonic hymn tune, what we now think of as a hymn tune. But this kind of tune, this kind of melody was not always the way that the church put forward these uh, these ideas and these themes. Uh, the music of Palestrina's time was very intricate, very ornate, sometimes almost overwhelmingly so. And the Lutheran tradition was a way of bringing that back, of simplifying it, of writing melodies that uh, everyone could sing often in German. And so these uh, these choral melodies form the basis of a huge amount of the music of the 17th and then 18th centuries. 
and Pachelbel used chorales, as indeed later on did Bach and so many others, as the basis for more complex compositions. And uh, in these settings, Pachelbel would elaborate on the chorale melody. So the chorale melody would be at the core of the music, but there would be intricate uh, counterpoint or harmonies or expressive text painting. And this approach allowed Pachelbel to create music that was both accessible to the congregation but had that sophistication, that artistic creativity, and also demonstrated his deep understanding of the role of music in Lutheran worship. And you can now start to appreciate why he was so well regarded in his time, why his music has stood the test of time and why it was so influential on the composers to follow him. And really, his choral music, uh, along with his organ music, is characterised by this blend of different textures. Sometimes you have intricate polyphony, as you can see here on screen. You have all these interweaving lines, but sometimes he decides to just treat the music as homophonic, that is to say, just chords. And uh, this approach, well, you can already imagine, had a huge influence on so many others. Um, and I've mentioned Martin Luther. There he is. Dear old Martin Luther, uh, who, who very famously nailed his treaties to the church door, um, proclaiming that it was time for a change in the church, a time to go back to a simpler form, to have church worship in the native language rather than in Latin, so that everyone could take part, um, to have tunes so simple that everyone could sing them with a strong connection to the text. Um, and Paco Bell himself, obviously, was, as I say, was working the Lutheran tradition, but was also influenced by those Italian composers and French composers, which helped shape his unique and innovative style. And this, well, this is obviously hugely important in the development of music as we went forwards. And the complexity and clarity of uh, Pachelbel's music is one of the hallmarks of his style. What I'd like to do is to play you a little bit of one of his Magnificats, everyone, which, of course, are, are settings of the hymn sung by the Virgin Mary uh, when she was told she was going to bear Christ. Uh, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. This text has been set thousands and thousands of times, but the original plain chant, the original plain song is a, a, a piece that Pachelbel went back to many times and set several times. Let's have a little bit of the Magnificat in D, which uh, I do believe Choir of the Earth is rehearsing at the moment. And if we have a listen, if we bear in mind what I've just said about the intricate lines, but also the homophonic texture, you'll have sometimes chords, sometimes you'll have interweaving lines, but always with a sense of emotional integrity and what's going on in the text. Here's a bit of the Magnificat, everyone. <laughs> very familiar as I say to those of you in Choir of the Earth and we can see here a little section of that Magnificat in D and if I just play it for you here some absolutely beautiful chords and although the underpinning harmony is, uh, is rather Lutheran. The shapes and the melodies, the melodic contours, as I said earlier on, uh, always have this slight air of the Italian, this sense of uh, a leading towards beautiful suspensions. 
for example, and then the beautiful use of the minor suspensions to really uh, dig deep, to dive deep, if you will, into the emotional context of the text. Now, it's not just these uh, rather... I don't want to say simple version of the Magnificat, but this version that you've just heard, of course, was written for uh, strings and for voices. But he did also write more festive and more elaborate and louder settings of the Magnificat. So we're going to have a little bit of the Magnificat in C, which is much more involved. And I just want to ask those of you who are familiar with the works of J.S. Bach, in particular his Magnificat, as we listen, I just want you to call to mind Bach's grand style, his use of, for example, percussion, his use of trumpets, and see if this piece reminds you of anything. Here we go. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous music, and as I said, doesn't it remind you of the music of J.S. Bach, in particular his setting of the Magnificat, the ornate, really intricate melodic lines, lots and lots of fast-moving semiquaver patterns, and when you look at example here of a Portuguese Baroque church, you can see uh, why the, the music and the art and the architecture are so linked together. Of course, the word Baroque is taken from the Portuguese, meaning a misshapen and ugly pearl. Uh, it was actually used as a derogatory term when it was first applied because the locals looked at architecture like this and thought it was hideous, and so they called it Baroque. But, of course, it's now come to mean this incredible epoch of music which was... Uh, uh, well, it was contained so many similar decorations and so many beautiful lines. And there, in that Magnificat setting, you have everything we've been talking about today. You have the beautiful polyphonic lines, you have the simplicity of the melody being presented uh, often in a very clear and homophonic way. You've got the emotional content, you've got the wonderful clashes. And really, this is a great way of summing up Packlebell and his contribution to choral music. It's had a lasting influence on Western music, in particular, as I said, composers such as J.S. Bach, but indeed more beyond them. And uh, it, although Bach did study uh, Packlebell's style, he obviously studies others, but you can really hear that influence. And many of Packlebell's choral works continue to be popular today, including that Magnificat in D, which Cry of the Earth are recording at the moment. But in addition to his influence on the Baroque period, Packerbell's influence was further uh, further ahead into the classical era because of his, uh, his emphasis on clear tonal structures, so that's to say a sense of where the tonality is rather than moving around. It's very clear whether we're in the minor or in the major, what key we're in, uh, and using that expressive harmony to support a beautiful, clear melody was very much a model for the classical style. So, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you've enjoyed our deep dive into Packlebell today. If you've enjoyed any of the music that you've heard, please do go along and listen to the examples which are in the description. Uh, do visit the channel, subscribe to them and like the videos. I would thoroughly recommend a full listen to both the Cantata and the Magnificat in C, which are absolutely brilliant. And next time you hear the Canon in D played on your local classical radio station, do just spare a moment for dear, dear Packlebell 
who was, as I say, from all accounts, a very, very well-respected and well-liked composer who had a huge influence on Bach and therefore on the music that we all love today and is far more than just that canon in D. Although, let's be honest, the canon in D is a masterpiece. So, ladies and gents, thank you for being here today. Next week, well, we're going to uh, we're going to have a look at some Bach. Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of Jesu Joy. That is to say, his cantata 147. Why did he write it? What are some of the features of this great work and how influential has it been? And one more time, Home Choir, of course, relies on your support. So please do give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. Do subscribe to the channel. It's all free. And having said that, again, those of you who donate, you keep this channel running. So thank you to all of you. If you'd like to buy us a coffee, there is a link in the description. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. I'll be back on Friday for something completely different of course it'll be fun friday and we'll be singing some fun and some silly songs so join me for that if you can and otherwise all the very best take care